Hello, I'm Nat Napolitano, and this is a top-level video in a series I'm creating called Keys to Reality. In this set of videos, what I want to do is pass along some gifts, some gifts to maybe young people who might have stumbled across this series of videos and start watching them. These are gifts of knowledge. These gifts are gifts that were given to me and my generation. They were given to me by brilliant physicists like Erwin Schrodinger and Isaac Newton, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, Albert Einstein, and great philosophers too like Immanuel Kant and David Hume. And hopefully these gifts that were given to my generation, hopefully we will take these gifts and pass them along to the next generation and hopefully pass them in as good a shape as we receive them, maybe even better in some cases. Now, when I talk about these men as being brilliant and contributing a lot to our lifestyle, what I, I, they've contributed in a couple ways. Um, obviously, it's, uh, the, the science has made a big contribution to the way we live. Right now, we enjoy a very comfortable lifestyle in the year 2012 in the United States and around the world. We have um, medicines that cure diseases that would have been deadly 60 or 70 years ago. We have all kinds of electronic conveniences. We have machines that do our heavy work for us, backbreaking work that we would have done by hand some uh, 100 years ago or so. And we have machines that do our thinking for us. And this is actually incredible. We, uh, we have machines that do the, the, the difficult and uh, boring thinking that people used to do by hand years ago, calculating huge stacks of numbers, looking up addresses and writing, writing them out. So we've benefited greatly. But these great physicists and philosophers, they've passed along something else. And this is what this series is about. What they've done is they've made some progress along the way to answering some questions, some very deep questions that sometimes we call existential questions, questions about our existence. And these are important questions, and this progress is what it's all about. The best way for me to show you what I'm talking about might be to just show you what the questions are. Why is there a universe? Why is there space? Um, there didn't have to be space. Why is, uh, why is uh, space expanding? There might even be multiple universes. Why is there stuff? Why is there matter rather than nothing? There didn't have to be stuff. What is time? Why do we seem to be having an experience in time and moving forward in time? Why are we conscious? Why are we having this conscious experience and feeling things as we travel through space and time? Are there other beings in our universe? Is there a greater being? And what is the purpose of our lives? These questions have existed for thousands of years. Some of the greatest minds our Earth has ever had have worked hard on these questions. But at the present time, we don't have any satisfactory answers. Now, why are these questions so important? Well, they are all directed at trying to figure out who we are. What's our relationship to the cosmos? Why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing? And what's our purpose? Now, why am I qualified to address these questions if so many brilliant men throughout history have tried and failed? Well, I suppose I'm not qualified. But that's just the point. Nobody's really qualified. These are deep questions, difficult questions. And actually, there's a good possibility we won't even have answers to these questions. As often happens in science, these questions might just get replaced with other questions as we gain a deeper knowledge of what our universe is all about. So all I'm really hoping to do is maybe deliver a little bit of the passion I have for science and for cosmology and for the study of the brain and our, our uh, uh, and brain science. And hopefully 
some, uh, some people in the next generation might see this video and become enthused about this and pick it up and start working on the problems themselves. It's actually quite fascinating. See, my strength is being able to organize data in different ways. I do this as a job and sometimes when you shift the data around you sometimes see some things that you didn't see before. Um, you see some connections. And this is what I'm trying to do here. I think the best way to illustrate that might be to jump right into it. I want to show you maybe a little bit of an organization of the data and the, uh, the methods that, that take place when um, we communicate knowledge to the next generation. Now the thing that one generation passes to the, to the next is culture. I mean, culture in includes the language, the food, the architecture, fashion, religion, and subtle attitudes. Um, a lot of things are in the culture, and some of it's so subtle that we don't even know it. We pick up on it, and it, be it becomes our fishbowl, the world we live in. Now, a part of the culture, at least in the West, is religion, technology, and science. And I'm looking at this in a little bit of an unusual way. One thing that's unusual here is I have religion driving science. And this is the case. Um, a lot of the scientific questions that I'm interested in, the ones about our existence, the existential questions, a lot of these are religious enterprises. They're all about the same kinds of questions that we've tried to answer with religion, except we do it in a different way. Science constrains the questions empirically, as they say. In other words, the questions are asked, but they're tested out. In fact, it's rare that a uh, question is raised in science where we don't propose some way to test the answer to that question. Another unusual thing I have here is technology driving science. It's often thought of the other way around, that science um, provides solutions and answers for technology. But the questions, the questions themselves, come from technology. They come from a need to have uh, an answer to something. Better materials, a better process, a solution to a problem that's going to be eventually uh, marketable or provide some benefit to mankind. A lot of these questions come from technology and they're passed along to science and we get scientific answers for those. Now the reason I'm dividing this is because it's the religious questions that I find more fascinating. The questions about our existence. Now, I have philosophy outside of the culture because it's the thing that's passed to the next generation. And I mean philosophy in a very broad sense. Now why did I slice up our map of reality in this way? Well, I wanted to make it clear that this set of videos is all about philosophy that philosophy is what we're passing forward to the next generation and we pass to other cultures. And I want to make it clear also that these religious questions or existential questions are what fuel our curiosity. So they go forward into science and so does technology. I also want to make it clear that science is providing for us a wealth of information and information we can trust uh, more than we can our intuitions in most cases. So, we're going to take what science has to offer and we're going to make sure that our philosophy doesn't deviate too far from the laws of nature that uh, science has given to us. Now the last thing I want to do before I sign off here is give you an answer, at least an answer that I find satisfying to one of the questions on our list. And this isn't a, uh, this may be wisdom or it may not be. Take it for what it's worth. For me, this is satisfying. The last question on our list, what is our purpose? Why are we here? Well, for me, the best answer to that question is that we're trying to answer the other questions on the list. Nothing else to me matters nearly that much. I want to understand who we are. What's our relationship to the world? What should we be doing? Anyway, I hope you enjoy this journey as much as I've been enjoying it. Thank you.